good morning and welcome to worship here at Bundamba Salvos. I'm sure you've noticed that we have something super special here um, happening today with the Sagala Church Parade. Last night they had a sleepover here at the hall, so we have some hero leaders among us. They, did, they didn't sleep. A, way, a wake over, oh my goodness. So we, we have some people that, that we owe some extra kindness and um, <laughs> um, yes, to today. Um, and they also prepared for some of us a special meal and I actually got to have white sauce with corned beef last night, which is something my family don't usually let me have. It was delicious. Um, but today we're very grateful for our Sagala kids and for their amazing leaders who have cared for them and taught them about Jesus all year long. We really want our kids and the kids in our community to know about Jesus because we believe that that's really important. So I take a moment to celebrate Sagala here in Bundamba. And I was just thinking about how there are so many things for us to be grateful about at this time of year. As a parent, I get to participate in so many reward ceremonies and graduation ceremonies and end of year concerts. And I'm grateful for the achievements that my kids have been able to make this year. I attend several Christmas parties and breakup parties for myself. And I'm so grateful for those who've invested in my kids' lives. And I'm grateful for those who've invested in my life. And, and I've just been feeling so blessed lately. And it has struck me that all of these blessings ultimately come from our good God. And he is the one that we do it all for. He is the one who pieces everything together. He is the one who makes sense of it all. He is the one who has sacrificed the most for me, who sacrificed the most for my family and for all of us today. He came as a baby so long ago to make a better future for us, it's kind of hard to comprehend that it happened so long ago, but for us, um, to make a way for something great for us all to look for, something great for us all to look forward to, and I'm talking about heaven now. And he also came to help us to grow bit by bit more and more like him, our lives improving every minute that we live for him from the moment that we trust in him. He has invested in us by dying for us. That is the strongest kind of love, the strongest kind of commitment. And now we're seeing the benefits of that kind of love every single day. And I'm so grateful, and I hope that you are too. And so I invite you to stand with me and to praise him with me today as we sing Build Your Kingdom here. Please stand with me.
There's at least one camper who didn't get enough sleep who doesn't want us to play another loud song. Uh, <laughs> would you please join with me in prayer? Father God, we come before you in worship this morning and recognise that you are the King of Kings. We pray, you taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we know we can't do that alone. You never wanted us to do that alone. So we ask you to, by your Holy Spirit to move among us this morning. Empower us to be your people, to live out our lives how you designed them to be lived. Lord, we pray this knowing that when your spirit comes and empowers us, you revive our lives, you revive the world around us. Lord, we need some reviving. We pray you'd come by your spirit, speak to us, transform us, Revive us by your spirit today, we pray. Amen. The first Bible reading this morning is taken from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through to 11. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all of these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshippers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulphur. This is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues came and said to me, come with me, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper and clear as crystal. Amen. We are in the first week of Advent. Yay! That's right. <laughs> Bit of excitement. Now, for many of us, we think about it, Advent is when we start, you know, we whip out the Christmas tree and we start to think about Christmas. And it is true, we celebrate the coming of Jesus. But Advent is also a time where we think about the second coming of Jesus, where we anticipate that our King is coming back and so our, our bible passages this morning are talking about when jesus will come again and we're going to sing together a, a song I'm going to invite you to stand that talks about when jesus comes again first time when jesus came the angels proclaimed um, the wonderful news well when jesus comes again the heavens will declare the glory of his name all creation will bow at the coming of her king I invite you to stand let's sing together shall do
every eye shall see. Revelations 22, commencing at verse 1 to verse 5, and then from verse 12 to 17. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign for ever and ever. And now from verse 12 through to 17. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the adulterers, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears says, come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. May God out his blessing to this word. A song that we often hear um, in this time of Advent at big carols, events and things like that actually comes from these readings this morning from Revelation 21 and 22. And it's called The Holy City. And the male voices are going to bring that to us this morning.
Kayleen came home from a few days away this week. Guys, any kids who have stayed home alone, you know that the pressure was on. Kayleen had left pretty clear directions of the kind of things that mattered to her, like putting the bin out, feeding the children. I knew what I was going to be held accountable for. But it had been raining a lot. I had distractions of greatest concern. I forgot where I put the list. <laughs> but I knew that when she came back that none of these excuses would be good enough. Well, we've been journeying through the final book of the Bible over the last six weeks. And there's numerous reasons why some of us tend to avoid revelation. It's rich in symbolism, and that's a nice way of saying it's confusing. And it's often been used to incite fear instead of what it says it's for, to bring us blessing. But another reason for avoiding it today is that we might think that it ends up with Jesus coming back to judge us for what we have done. It turned out to be great to have Kayleen come home. Our, our home was quickly restored. And there was no sneak preview of Armageddon. <laughs> but Revelation does paint Jesus' return as a day of reckoning, when everyone will be judged according to what they have done. And this is not a comfortable thought. We live in a world that rejects judgment as bad. We are told as Christians that we're not to write people off. But we need to push back against the idea that judgment is bad if we're going to hear Revelation's good news for us today. It is true that there will be people who don't enjoy when Jesus comes back and judges them. There is no way of putting a good spin on what is going to happen to those who have rejected God. But even in judgment... God shows us his love. Telling us that there will be a judgment is an act of love. God loves us too much to leave us unaware of where our sin will lead us. But that's not where the love of judgment stops. Remember that the revelation was first heard by people whose family members were crucified or burnt alive. They were no doubt struggling with Jesus' instructions to forgive their enemies and to seek good for them. They had accepted a new eternal life with Christ. But they wouldn't want life to go on like this for eternity. When they heard the different images of judgment in Revelation, they would have received them as a promise. God won't let this go on forever. He is giving time for people to be redeemed. But he is going to do something about injustice. He is going to fix what is broken about our world. He will put an end to all that harms his good creation. God loves us too much not to judge. He is going to set things right. There is a whole lot more we could say about that. But today we want to hear what comes at the end of the book. And that's right, judgment is not the big news of the end of the book. The big news is what comes next. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. In these past um, few, couple of years, with the pandemic, the lockdowns, the political manoeuvring of the superpowers, even the routine health and relationship dramas that we face, it's left some Christians eager to leave this world behind. Many of us will have heard stories of a rapture where those who belong to God are taken away from this world. But that is not the message of hope that God gives to his people. Sure, those who die before the end are gathered together in the throne room, uh, throne room of God. But the end game of God is even bigger than that. The movement of the end of the Bible is not away from our world. 
God gives us a vision of a new heaven and earth coming down to creation. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. But some may object. Didn't Revelation start with Jesus coming on the clouds? And doesn't it say elsewhere that we're going to go and meet him in the sky? Well, yes, the Bible does present Jesus coming back to earth from the direction that the disciples saw him leave. It does talk about us going to meet him and being caught up with those who had gone before us. But what is imaged in these scenes is the people going to greet the returning victorious king. If any of you are Lord of the Rings fans, you will have seen a similar scene as the people of Gondor Gondor go out to greet Boromir, lining lining the way home to cheer on the victorious as they return to the city. What the Bible depicts for us is that when Jesus returns, we will go and we will greet our victorious king and we will join him in his triumphal entry into the city. But we won't be coming back to life as usual. When King Jesus returns, his victory over evil means that he brings with him a restored, renewed creation. There'll be no more death, no more mourning, No more pain. The sea of rebellion and chaos will be gone. We are given a vision of a world made new. The best John can do to describe the indescribable beauty of what God has in store for us is to describe the city being made of gems. I didn't include that in the Bible reading because some of the words are hard. Um, But have a read of it yourself, chapter 21. And as we get to the end of chapter 21, we're given the measurements of the new Jerusalem. Now, this might seem odd to us in a vision that's obviously symbolic and not literal, that we're given specific measurements until we realise that the measurements that were given would cover the entire Roman Empire. To people who were being creamed by the power of Rome, God doesn't give them a vision of escaping, but shows them a time is coming when this stained empire that has rejected God and spoiled his good creation will be replaced by his new holy kingdom. There'll be no more pain, no more death. But the beauty is not just in what won't be there. Over and over, John tells us the good news that God will be there and he will dwell with his people. It is the merging of heaven and earth. The measurements given are cubic and would have been recognisable to the um, first audience of this letter. That what was being described was the holy of holies in the temple. The sacred space which was seen as the dwelling place of the presence and power of God. Only one priest per year could go into the Holy of Holies. The revelation given to John depicts the whole oppressive, immoral, violent empire of Rome being covered by this Holy of Holies, where all the saints of God would dwell and God would be there with his people. God would not be limited or isolated to a small room in a temple. He in, sorry, his presence and power will be with his people, actively wiping the tears from their eyes, setting all things right. Have you ever wondered, is this as good as it gets? When we face injustice, when tragedies strike, when we're touched by the death of a loved one, there is something inside us that just knows we were created for better than this. And today, God affirms these suspicions. He wants to lead us to the better future he has prepared for us. But how do we know that we get to be part of this future? Will we be the ones joining in the victory parade, or will we be the ones who are defeated and punished? Well, God gives us some examples of those who miss out. Those who miss out are the cowards. Those who give in to the pressures of a fallen world. Unbelievers. 
the corrupt, the sexually immoral, all who love and live lies will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, it says. So who gets to be part of God's great future? Who are the victorious? Who can stand to be judged according to what we have done? We know that we have all sinned. In the new creation, nothing that pollutes God's good creation will be allowed to enter. There's, there'll be no more selfishness, no envy, no impatience. Not one of us deserves a place in new creation. But right at the end of the book, the last time that it says we will be judged by what we have done, it tells us what the victorious have done. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat from the fruit of the tree, from the tree of life. It is not those who have never done anything wrong. Otherwise, Jesus would be all alone. It is those who have accepted the sacrifice of Jesus, who receive his forgiveness and power to be made clean. God longs for everyone to come to him and be washed clean. He says to all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the spring of the water of life. Everyone who is willing to trust and follow Jesus will be the victorious who inherit the beautiful future that God has planned. God says, I will be your God and you will be my children. Well, perhaps the biggest question that many of us have when we turn to the last book of the Bible is, when? When will God call time on all this? When will this beautiful new creation be fulfilled? And one of the reasons that reading Revelation is a challenge is because it doesn't follow a linear timeline. All the way through, we hear pictures of God's realm and where he's leading us, intertwined with descriptions of the struggles that we face today. And even here at the end, John doesn't stay with a final picture. In chapter 21, after describing a world with no more pain and suffering, a world where God lives with his people, God declares, see, I am making all things new. It is in the present continuing tense that God says this in his revelation to us. The final chapter describes a river flowing from the throne of God, a river that brings life and healing to the nations. That river flows from the throne of God today. God blesses us to experience and provide a taste of his new creation today. God shows us the nature of where he's taking us so that we can start living as people who belong where he is taking us. If spending time in the presence of God is not your thing, then life in the new creation will be far from heaven. It will be unbearable. If you can't handle calls to take action to protect the earth, then life in the new creation of God is going to be most uncomfortable for you. If looking out for the needs of others, embracing foreigners, being brothers and sisters with people who are very different from you is not your thing, then life in the new creation will be torturous. On the flip side, if we allow the Spirit to come and transform us, to wash us clean through accepting Jesus as our Saviour, if we allow the river of grace to come from the throne of God and satisfy our deepest needs, then we will find great joy in becoming who we were created to be. When God's nature shapes our minds and our hands, then we get a taste of the abundant life right here and now. We become people for whom the new restored creation will be home. The revelation ends with the spirit and the bride extending an invitation. The Holy Spirit extends to each one of us an invitation this morning. The faithful people of God who have gone before us, who have proven that God is powerful to redeem and restore, their witness calls us to come. All who know Jesus are compelled by the Spirit to share this invitation 
Come, anyone who is thirsty, come and drink freely from the water of life. The invitation to come to the living water is not a one-off invitation. God is continuing to make all things new. He wants to continue his work of restoration in you this morning. We will know that we have come to the living water this morning as we are assured that our sins are forgiven. We will know that we are drinking from the water of life as the Spirit assures us that we are loved by God. He is our God and we are his children. We know that we are drinking from the water of life when we hear the news that Jesus is coming again and we get excited about it. Bring it on. Please set things right, Jesus. Start with me. Please come, Lord Jesus, come. Our final song this morning, O Boundless Salvation, Deep Ocean of Love. We're going to sing verses 1 and 2. And then we'll read a verse. Ready? Right? One and verses one and two.
our benediction this morning, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. We're going to have the exit of the colour party and then we'll have opportunity for you to worship in the giving of your offering.